Beloved, let us pray. Gracious Father, you know what's going on in our lives. All these different places where we are gathered together to worship this morning, to call upon your name, to ask, to plead, to praise. We thank you for your presence, your faithfulness in our lives. And God, we ask that you would visit in such a very close, intimate, real way those who need your touch this morning. God, we pray for the leadership of our nation, of our world, of our, of our state, of our city, of our communities. Guide and direct each one of us. Show us what our part is in your hierarchy, in your kingdom, God. Help us to be the people that you have designed us to be so that we might bring the shalom that you desire wherever we are. Thank you, God, for your who you are. Thank you for hearing, for caring, for loving, for sharing these things we ask in your precious and holy name together this morning. And all God's people said, Amen. Pride. It's a good word, but it has so many negative connotations. This week in our constant contact, I mentioned the cliche, pride goes before a fall. This is your revelation time. Does anyone care to share about a time when they were hurt or embarrassed, wanted to crawl under the rug because of your pride? Go ahead, answer, <laughs> answer that in the Facebook feed down below. I would like to I would like to hear it because I have too many to share. I can think of so many times that I did not actually fall, but I was too afraid to fail. So I did not, I would not even try something. For me, it seems that fear is the backside of pride. Fear of failing, fear that others might see you differently, Fear that people might actually see who you are. So it is better to just not. Just not even try. Pride. This morning we're going to think about the important role humility plays in receiving God's grace. In James chapter 4 verse 6 we read, But he gives more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Our scripture this morning, our main scripture, is from the Old Testament in 2 Kings chapter 5. But that verse that I just read from the New Testament, James is reminding us that God has a gift for us, but we might miss out on it if our pride clouds our vision and our understanding. So now I'm reading from 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. I will be reading from the Message Translation. Naaman was general of the army under the king of Aram. He was important to his master, who held him in the highest esteem, because it was by him that God had given victory to Aram, a truly great man, but afflicted with a grievous skin disease. It so happened that Aram, on one of its raiding expeditions against Israel, captured a young girl who became a maid to Naaman's wife. One day she said to her mistress, Oh, if only my master could meet the prophet of Samaria, he would be healed of his skin disease. Naaman went straight to his master and reported what the girl from Israel had said. Well, then go, said the king of Aram, and I'll send a letter of introduction to the king of Israel. So he went off, taking with him about 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothes. <clears throat> Naaman delivered the letter to the king of Israel. The letter read, When you get this letter, you'll know that I've personally sent my servant Naaman to you. Heal him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he was terribly upset, ripping his robe to pieces. He said, Am I a God with the power to bring death or life that I get orders to heal this man from his disease? What's going on here? That king's trying to pick a fight, that's what. Elisha, the man of God, heard what had happened, that the king of Israel was so distressed that he'd ripped his robe to shreds. He sent word to the king, Why are you so upset, ripping your robe like this? Send him to me so he'll learn that there's a prophet in Israel. 
So Naaman with his horses and chariots arrived in style and stopped at Elisha's door. Elisha sent out a servant to meet him with this message. Go to the river Jordan and immerse yourself seven times. Your skin will be healed and you'll be good as new. Naaman lost his temper. He turned on his heel saying, I thought he'd personally come out and meet me. Call on the name of God. Wave his hand over the disease spot and get rid of the disease. The Damascus rivers at Bana and Farpar are cleaner by far than any of the rivers in Israel. Why not bathe in them? I'd at least get clean. He stomped off mad as a hornet. But his servants caught up with him and said, Father, if the prophet had asked you to do something hard and heroic, wouldn't you have done it? So why not this simple wash and be clean? So he did it. He went down and immersed himself in the Jordan seven times, followed the orders of the holy man. His skin was healed. It was like the skin of a little baby. He was good as new. He then went back to the holy man. He and his entourage stood before him and said, I now know beyond the shadow of a doubt there is no God anywhere on earth other than the God of Israel. In gratitude, let me give you a gift. This is the word of God for the people of God. And all God's people said, thanks be to God. Naaman, the name of this general, means pleasant, delightful, gracious, not a very not a very apt name for a general, is it? I would think of something more warlike as to be the perfect name. And Naaman's attributes are listed in verse one. We just read them. But he also had leprosy, which canceled everything out, canceled out all the good stuff. Right now, I want you to ask yourself, oh, I would love it, beloved, if you had a journal right now and you were making notes. So that's how I study, that's how I read. But the question to ask yourself right now is, what are your strengths? Be honest. It's not prideful if you know that you have skills and gifts. What are your strengths? And now what are your leprosies? Do you have a weakness, something that prevents you from being whole, prevents you from doing what you want to do, what you know you need to do, what you feel like you were created to do. What is your leprosy? The skin disease that Naaman had called leprosy in many of the translations in the Bible. And there were many ailments called that in his culture. All of them were mysterious and frightening. Naaman's was most likely in its early stages because only his family, his household servants, and his closest friends were aware of it. However, leprosy was a dreaded disease that like sin, starts small and spreads with disastrous results, both physically and socially. But Naaman was shown how to receive gracious humility. In his household, one of the members was a young girl that he had captured on one of his military raids to Israel. She was now serving as a little maid to his wife. Instead of an attitude of hatred and resentment, however, what we see in this little girl is a desire to help the man who stole her from her own home and family. She could have responded resentfully to her forced servitude to being a slave, but she chose to respond instead as a representative of the family of Israel. Though she was a slave in a foreign land, she still represented God and her gracious humility shines. This little girl could have so easily allowed pride to dominate her thoughts and attitudes and said to herself, the God of my country could heal him. Too bad for him. But she shared with her captors, she shared her knowledge of her own God. And in my mind, Naaman would have been suspicious to be advised to go back to the land that he had just raided. But he immediately asked permission from the king to go check out this young girl's story, showing how desperate he must have been feeling. So Naaman also had desperate humility. So he went back to Israel, this time not to conquer, but to be conquered. 
He arrived a proud man and he left a humble one. Here's how it happened. Naaman and his entourage greeted the king of Israel. They presented him with this letter, this request from the king of Aram, this country that they'd been at war at, and asking the king of Israel to help Naaman. That was pretty presumptuous of them. And the king of Israel was just, ah, what do I do? I can't do that. What is he asking me? Is he looking for a fight? Is he wanting to start war again? So Elisha heard about it. Apparently there's, there's a good gossip grapevine going in there too, just like there is on Facebook right now. You can find out pretty much anything you need to know. And so Elisha sent for Naaman. Think about this. The prophet, the churchy guy, sent for the general of the mighty army. What a step down for the general, right? So Naaman was coming from the splendor of the king's palace to this humble prophet's home of Elisha. And Naaman's entourage was loaded. Remember what they had? Hundreds of pounds of, of silver and gold and garments of fancy clothing. And, um, but did you, did you catch what happened? When they get to this, they're probably expecting, you know, at least a grand home. And then they come to this little, uh, and Elisha doesn't even come outside. He sends his servant outside. He doesn't even go talk to him. What, what's going on? That's not exactly the response this mighty general was expecting to receive, is it? He sends a servant outside. He was insulted. It was degrading. He was angry. He was infuriated. And he said, do what? Bathe where? In the Jordan? How many times? Seven? The Jordan was a sluggish river, as murky as it was mild. It was completely unimpressive and dirty. Naaman had come from Syria, where the rivers cascaded down from the mountains, crystal clear, beautiful rivers, waters, creeks from the cool mountain heights. Compared to the rivers in Syria, the Jordan River was like a muddy ditch. Naaman had expectations, even though he had this terrible disease that he needed to have taken care of. Otherwise he was just socially. He had expectations about how this was gonna happen, right? He, he thought that there'd be some kind of magic or potion or hocus pocus or, um, you know, a ceremony or what? He had a, but this was not it. What he, what he got was not what he was expecting. So how many times has that happened with you? You've seen your need. You've gone to someone to help you only to be given some advice or some remedy so different from what you were expecting. Something so simple, so unimpressive that it, maybe it was even insulting your intelligence. Oh my word, that can't be happening. That's not, I shouldn't have come. Something so undignified that you dismissed it in disgust. This is where Naaman is right now, washing that dirty river. Why doesn't that prophet pray some fancy prayer or speak some magical incantation or wave his hands or do some voodoo? Something impressive, something mysterious that I don't understand. Plot twist. Naaman was insulted. He was humiliated. Think how often Think how often we choose to be humiliated instead of humbled. When the circumstances could be a platform for learning or improving or just stopping, and yet we choose to be angry or humiliated or discouraged or depressed, there's that pride thing we're talking about this morning. Naaman was ready to march off in self-righteous anger, but he was still suffering. He had not been healed. He had not achieved what he came for because he had expectations of what he thought 
should be happening. So he stomped off. The message says he was mad as a hornet. But Naaman was surrounded by people with a clearer perspective than he had. People who cared about him. That little slave girl who should have hated him. And now his soldiers who were his subordinates and might have feared him. Most of us have been around military enough, at, at least on movies or on the television, to understand some of the hierarchy. You do not question your superior officer, especially if they are angry. But look what happened now in verse 13 in chapter 5 of 2 Kings. We just read it, but look back at verse 13. This is huge. Father, if the prophet had asked you to do something hard and heroic, wouldn't you have done it? So why not this simple wash and be clean? They persuaded him that he had nothing to lose and perhaps everything to gain by setting aside his pride, his expectations, and humbling himself. So in addition to having gracious humility and desperate humility, Naaman has submissive humility. So Naaman waded into the muddy Jordan River, dipped in the water seven times and was healed. Naaman was healed despite not understanding or liking what he was asked to do. Obedience is different than compliance. Compliance has the attitude of, I'll do it, but I don't have to like it. I might do it. You might make me sit down, but I'm still standing up on the inside. Obedience, however, has the attitude of, I will do it, even though I don't understand it, because I trust you. And that's where Naaman got. That's the point he achieved. Naaman was a man who was used to being in charge. He was the general of the army, well esteemed by the king. He was an important guy and humility, humility was not really in his wheelhouse. He was the one who issued the orders and who made the decisions. He took control of the circumstances. But his pilgrimage to Israel was a series of immersions into the waters of humility. He submitted to his wife's maid, to Elisha's servant, to his own servants. In each case, Naaman surrendered his will to someone who was of a lower socioeconomic status than he was. Pride. Naaman was hurting enough to set aside his pride. He was willing to submit. That's what it is about grace. Grace characteristically comes through humbling ourselves. If we are too arrogant, too full of ourselves to listen to others, if we are too adamant about what we think, about the way we think God should come to us, then we might miss the most important gift of all, the gift of grace that God has ready for us. The results of dismissing arrogantly can be relying on my own strength. It's not usually good enough. My own abilities, never enough. The same old, same old things aren't going to change. No healing. But on the flip side, the results of submissive humility are physical healing and a new outlook. Bob Goff, who's written a couple of really interesting books, says, humble people do not fall for the liars pride tries to entice us with to fake it. The liars that promote self-confidence, self-control, self-reliance. I can do it. I don't need anybody's help. You know, those are liars. We do need each other. We do need God. We do need to humble ourselves and learn how to take a, a do-over. In Zechariah 4.10, we read, Who dares despise the day of small things. Things don't have to be grandiose, mysterious, ceremonial to be meaningful and effective. Looking at verse 12, we're reminded, 
maybe Naaman wanted to be healed as he did with, without doing anything on his own because he didn't want to have to take off his armor and expose himself. Pride. To come clean, to get clean, you have to expose the leprosy. Turn your expectations upside down. Who receives the glory in God's kingdom? Those who have the courage to admit they are needy. Those who have the audacity to humble themselves enough to be humble. Then, and only then, can our loving, grace-filling God find the space to heal us of ourselves and to become the love that God wants to fill the world around us with. So Naaman's humbling resulted in his healing. Unmask the pride. Maybe your leprosy doesn't show. How willing are you to continue living as if you are whole without God's grace filling healing? How willing are you? What is the real cost of not allowing God to unmask your pride and heal you? Let us pray. Gracious Father, we are so filled up with ourselves that there's not enough room for you. Please unmask us. Empty us of our pride, of our notions of self, so that you can come and be to us what you want to. Help us, God. Show us how to love you better by allowing you to fill us with you. These things we pray. Amen. Christ said, as oft as we do this, we do it in remembrance of him. And we remember the sacrifice he made and the victory he gained. Oh, how could it be that my God would welcome me into this mystery? Say, take this bread, take this wine, now the simple made divine for any to receive. By your mercy we come to your table. By your grace you are making us faithful. Lord, we remember you. And remembrance leads us to worship. And as we worship you, our worship leads to communion. We respond to your invitation. We remember. body his blood know that he has overcome every trial we will face and none too lost to be saved none too broken or ashamed all are welcome in this place by your mercy we come to your table by your grace you are making us faithful Lord, we remember you, and remembrance leads us to worship, and as we worship you, our worship leads to communion, we respond to your invitation, we remember Dying, you destroyed our death. Writing, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored.
on making us faithful. Lord, we remember you. And remembrance leads us to worship. And as we worship you, our worship leads to communion. We respond to your invitation. We respond to you.